On Tech News Today, Amazon invents a new way to pay book authors by the page. Samsung invents the invisible truck, and the EU invents a new way to meddle with Google search results. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, June 22nd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Warby Parker Eyewear. Get boutique quality classically crafted eyewear, including sunglasses, at revolutionary prices. For a free home try-on of five stylish frames of your choice, plus free three-day shipping, go to warbyparker.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin. Our co-anchor today is CNET Editor-in-Chief Lindsay Turrentine. Welcome, Lindsay. What's going on? It's a beautiful Monday morning after a beautiful Father's Day weekend. It certainly was. And I was just, we started, I started to tell you before the show uh, that I uh, went sailing over the weekend. My son surprised me on Father's Day with a sail, an amazing sail, in the uh, San Francisco Bay, which is a it can be a somewhat challenging place to sail, but beautiful yesterday. Just a really incredible uh, sail. We went from uh, Brisbane all the way to the um, to the to uh, basically to the city, essentially uh, to the Bay Bridge and back, and it was amazing. But I, but he was using a service that I don't hear people talking about a lot. It's called Boatbound. It's basically the AT and T. I mean, it's the the uh, Airbnb of. Uh, Boating services, I guess you, you can say. You basically just rent a boat for a half day or for the day. And it was just such a great experience, all of it. Um, so anyway, anybody who's That's into boating so cool. and, and knows how to sail, make sure you know, know how to sail. Uh, or, Do you have to prove or, it? Do you have to prove that you know how to sail to, to make the rental? He did all the all the arrangements, so I can't speak authoritatively about what's required. But um, but I, I do know that the boat and, uh, owners have an interest in making sure you know how to handle the boat. Sure. And and, uh, and and the company, of course, they'll provide a certain amount of assur insurance, and they will tow if you have a problem and do stuff like that. So it's a it's a really great service. Of course, they have motor boats as well. So anybody who's into boating, check it out. Boat. It's called BoatBound.co. Well, Lindsay, why don't we do the news? We're here. The news is Let's here. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it. Let's do it. Well, behold, the power of Taylor Swift. The singer posted a tweet yesterday complaining that Apple wasn't going to pay artists for music streamed during their three-month free trial and threatened to withhold a recent album from Apple Music. Then, less than 24 hours later, Apple reversed its policy publicly and said they would pay artists during that three-month free trial. John... Jurgensen wrote about the story for the Wall Street Journal and joins us now. Welcome to you, John. Hi there. Hey. So didn't Apple negotiate the terms with the music labels? And isn't it the music labels call to decide what the what those terms are? Yeah, I mean, this is a long process of negotiation with the labels. And uh, I'm sure it was an epic saga <laughs> that, yeah. that went on probably longer than they would have liked to go on to. But, um, you know, I think what all this happens, you know, without the voice of the artist really being represented. And I think that's what makes this kind of interesting is that Taylor Swift took this upon herself to speak up on behalf of the artist community um, and, and sort of do something on independently and, and maybe make some moves that might not have necessarily, she necessarily clear with her, her label or anyone else, but uh, it certainly had some big waves. So Taylor Swift is sort of representing this issue for artists and like you said, taking it upon herself. This isn't the first time she's complained. She's had a similar argument with Spotify, which is why 1989, her album hasn't been on Spotify. Who does she represent? I assume that there are other people complaining here. It's not just Taylor Swift. Yeah, I mean, she alluded to this in her Tumblr message, her open letter to Apple, um, that, that she was not just speaking on behalf of herself. Uh, she was talking about people in her circle who uh, were also concerned about this. Um, and I guess she was, probably feels like she's the one who is the most bulletproof when it comes to this stuff. You know, she's going to risk uh, maybe soiling or spoiling her relationship with Apple and other big companies to take a stand. And of course, as you go see from the letter, she did it put in very polite terms and very sort of praise, praised Apple a lot in her, in her, uh, her note. Um, yeah, but she's not the. She's far from the only one who's complained about this, especially this free three, three month trial period that Apple's been offering, uh, where royalties weren't going to be paid to artists. 
Uh, independent labels had spoken about this. Uh, XL Recordings, the beggars group, uh, which is home to Adele, uh, you know, obviously no slouch when it comes to uh, uh, records, uh, also spoke out about this and said they hadn't reached a deal with Apple over just this this very topic. So, you know, other people have been grumbling about it, but she's the one who uh, got the swift results. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was, was either good. you or me, man. One of yeah, us is going to do it. Someone had to do it. <laughs> yeah. So one of the fascinating things about this story is that uh, for a long time, because of streaming, because of downloading music, because the business has changed so much, artists have been essentially shafted in the actual payment for their work at, in terms of recorded music. And they've had to scrounge around and try to make money elsewhere, like on concerts or on merchandise or, you know, uh, sponsorships or whatever it is. But the actual music is not... A big, a big money maker these days for for the artists themselves. Is this changing? I mean, it seems like these streaming services are really competing for either exclusive content in the case of Tidal versus Apple and so on, or exclusive deals, or tr to try to prevent um, people like Taylor Swift from pulling albums from the services. Does all of this? Does the do the new changes in the streaming music market put the artists back in charge to a certain extent? Uh, I think it's probably too soon to say that's the case. I mean, you have someone like a Taylor uh, or a Jay-Z or a Jack White or Madonna who, you know, have tremendous visibility. And the biggest thing they have is their, you know, their fame and their platform through which to speak. Uh, so they can, uh, you know, make waves by doing things like this. A lot of other artists are really sort of tilting against the wind uh, when it comes to this stuff. We're in this weird, funky gray zone of, of a cultural shift where, you know, downloads, paid downloads, which were uh, was what put iTunes on the map and was kind of a lifeboat for the industry for a long time, uh, are really declining. Um, and streaming is the norm now. Uh, whether people are actually being paying for streaming, you know, music fans are going to be paying subscriptions. Is 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 still hasn't really gotten a lot of traction, at least not as much as um, both artists and labels would hope. Um, so what they need to do is just go full force into this realm, uh, and you have someone like an Apple who is in a position to to you know make a big change and bring a lot of people on board to the streaming economy. Um, so unless they that can happen, unless they can really get a lot of people signed up, that sort of withering of revenues that you talked about is just going to keep happening, and and we might just be in this plateau of of music revenues being you know uh, a small part of a of a of an artist's uh, pot. I don't think we're ever going to go back to the good old days or what artists perceive as the good old days. Um, but uh, certainly there's a lot of room to be made up on the streaming subscription side if people would jump on board. So I love the way Taylor Swift put this. She was very blunt. She basically says a quarter of a year is a very long time to work for free. And, you know, she says, this is a direct quote, we don't ask you for free iPhones. Please don't very ask lying. you to Please don't ask us to provide you with our music for no compensation. So very bluntly put, how much is this actually costing Apple? Do you know? Oh, that's I don't know the answer to that question. That, that, is, that is a great question. Um, you know, uh, someone who I was talking to yesterday was saying that the money that would go off the table or the money that's at stake here in this three-month trial period is something like years worth of royalties being paid out over over time. I'm not really sure how the math works out on that true, but I mean, if you think about an artist who's putting out an album, you know, even a big star, uh, the reality is, is they're gonna get the most streams that they're ever gonna get for that album, probably within the first few weeks. I mean, that's the make or break period when it comes to uh, attention in terms of, you know, mind share for a record or when it comes to dollars and cents of people, you know, clicking those streams and an artist getting royalties for it. So if you're not getting any of those streams, if you have an album planned for release, say next month or in August, uh, you're really going to miss the boat and that money's not going to be coming back later. Um, so the fact that, you know, for, for a lot of artists who have a lot of plans in these next few months uh, that we're going to miss out on them, I mean, that was just... You know, I, the livid was the word I've heard yesterday <laughs> used often enough. Well, I think it's interesting. And I know that Apple, uh, they know who has the power in the music industry. They know that they don't want to have a uh, parting of ways with Taylor Swift because, of course, they w are never, ever getting back together. Uh, J John <laughs> Jurgensen is at WSJ.com. You can follow him on Twitter at John Jurg. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. More news in just a sec. But first, I want to tell you about our sponsor today, Warby 
Parker. I've been a big fan of Orby Parker since I first got my first pair of glasses from them, and I had a really great experience. Now, you're probably familiar with Orby Parker. They're in the news a lot. They get a lot of chatter around Silicon Valley. If you're in technology, you hear a lot about this company because they have the new way to buy glasses and get high-quality glasses at very low prices. But first, let me tell you about my experience with Warby Parker. I sent in my prescription. I went through the whole process. I sent away. I chose the glasses that I wanted to try. They sent me a box, a really awesome box of glasses for you to try on. It's unbelievable that they do this. And and then you just you try on these different glasses, and, and you see which ones you like, which ones you don't, how they fit, how they look. You can ask your family and friends, how do these look, and take your time with it. And then when you're ready, you just send it in with your prescription, and they'll send you back a beautiful pair of glasses. Now, when I did this, my, uh, op, you know, the, the, the optometrist made a mistake. They didn't send the, the information about the, the distance between the eyes. There, there's a, a measurement that they take when they measure your eyes at the, at, when you're fitting for glasses. And they made that mistake. But instead of uh, just telling me, you know, go back to the, to, to the optometrist and get this information, they had an online test to get the measurement directly. I did it in like a minute and they were like, okay, we got it. We're on their way. And the measurement was literally perfect. It was such a great experience. And this is part of the great thing about Warby Parker. When you go and buy glasses on Warby Parker, they become your partner through the whole process, right from the beginning all the way through the end. They keep in communication with you. They, 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 they give you little uh, suggestions and hints about how to pick and how to how to send it back, and they, they never let you leave you hanging. They never leave you out there on your own with this whole process. They're always there from start to finish. And then even after you buy the glasses, they are in touch. And, uh, you know, it's just a fantastic company. You know, and, of course, the reality is that they will sell you glasses at a fraction of what other manufacturers will charge. Glasses cost $400, $500 and more these days. So expensive. And so what people do... What people end up doing, and it's really sad, they end up getting lower quality glasses. With Warby Parker, for the same money as low quality glasses, you can get super high quality glasses, and that's really the way to, to go. It's just a great service if you wear glasses, and uh, you got to try Warby Parker. There's no downside. Try Warby Parker stylish glasses with their free home try-on program. Just go to warbyparker.com slash TNT, choose five pair of glasses, and Warby sends them to you so you can try them on. They, they include a simple special frame box and prepaid shipping label for easy return. Simply choose the frames you want, enter your prescription details if needed, and Warby Parker takes care of the rest. And for every pair of glasses you buy, Warby Parker sends a pair to someone in need. That's right. Just by getting great glasses for yourself, you will also be getting great glasses for somebody who needs them. They partner with nonprofits like Vision Spring. So give Warby Parker a try for a stylish pair of prescription glasses or sunglasses at warbyparker.com slash TNT. Get the free home try on and get the free three day shipping on your final frame purchase. That's warbyparker.com slash TNT. And we thank Warby Parker for their support of Tech News Today. Amazon is introducing a new machine learning platform for improving customer reviews of products for sale on Amazon. Ben Fox Rubin is a tech reporter for CNET and joins us to talk about it. Welcome to you, Ben. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Now, Ben, what problem is this change designed to solve and how does it work? I think the, the problem is, is that if certain products have uh, reviews that are maybe three, four, five, uh, six years old, this uh, new AI platform that they started to introduce on Friday will be able to start surfacing some newer reviews, more helpful reviews that have been voted up by other users and also provide some reviews that um, it will vote up reviews that are also uh, from verified purchasers on Amazon. So you can uh, go on Amazon and say that you're reviewing a product, even though you haven't actually bought it directly through Amazon. Maybe you bought it through somewhere else. This way, um, Amazon at least knows and can vouch for the fact that these are people that really bought the products. So this thing started on Friday. They flipped the switch but say it's going to be slow, when do you think people will be able to notice the difference? Or do you think that people will be able to notice the difference at all? Will things just kind of get better slowly? I, I think probably the second one. It's, it's hard to say if people are really going to notice much at all about it. Um, it's just 
hopefully going to be a little bit more helpful for the folks that do actually check the reviews and want to look at them. You know, for, for more esoteric stuff, maybe you're going to see stuff that's a little bit more relevant or a little bit newer. One of the examples that Amazon mentioned to me was this idea of certain products that maybe don't get like a, like a big flashy upgrade. Like this isn't going from like an iPhone 5S to an iPhone 6. It's just these small tweaks to make the product a little bit better or to address certain customer concerns. And they don't really change the name of the product. It doesn't get a new uh, label or anything like that. Well, different reviews that are, <clears throat> excuse me, different reviews that are a little bit uh, more relevant to the, the newest form of that product are now much more likely to come up. So again, that's just in an effort to make it more useful and more helpful for folks. It seems to me that the, uh, the bigger problem with reviews, maybe it's not a bigger problem. I mean, old out of date reviews are a problem. Uh, but there's also a, a sort of pandemic on not just Amazon, but anywhere we have reviews, including customer reviews online, where people either either competitors will go in there and write a nasty gram as a review, or uh, or it'll, there'll be a, a grassroots campaign to get all kinds of people to say something specific, either positive or negative for a product, uh, or people start joking around. Sometimes uh, a product is a little ridiculous, and people write hilarious uh, <laughs> reviews, which are, as funny as they are, not very helpful uh, to people who are trying to figure out whether to buy a banana slicer or whatever. Uh, are they uh, intending to tackle those types of problems or, or, or is this just going to solve the ones that you, uh, you specified? So from my conversation with Amazon, they, I, I asked them that specifically and they said that this, like the whole issue with fake reviews, which is a really big concern for Amazon, and they have a lot of, you know, manual and automated efforts to try to reduce fake reviews, like the astroturfing that you described, Mike, as far as folks going in, either a competitor or somebody that's been paid to write a positive or a negative review about a product. They claim that this isn't really the reason for doing these types of uh, this this specific change. Like this is really just to try to make it more helpful for regular users. But you could assume that if if this you know kind of machine learning platform does in fact end up surfacing stuff that's just phony baloney or you know red flagged in one way or another, then then yeah, they'll use it for that too. I would imagine. I really hope those banana slicer reviews do yeah. not go away. Yes, no, right. That makes my life better. Yeah, I mean, like the funny reviews there, I, I think it's all part of like the whole culture of like the Amazon reviews and like people look at Amazon reviews a lot more for those types of like silly or ridiculous reviews than, you know, some other areas. I, I don't know, like does, does TripAdvisor have the same thing or Yelp where like people congregate and start making up ridiculous reviews of stuff? I, I, Amazon's the only one that I really know of and I don't think that they want to try to get rid of that. That's a way for people to like you know, go to the site and kind of just get a good laugh about a banana slicer. I mean, it doesn't seem that bad to me. It's literally the most entertaining thing about Amazon.com. And, and I hope they don't do away with it. In fact, they should create a TV show about it Run it on Amazon TV. Ben Fox Rubin is at CNET.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Ben Fox Rubin. Thanks, thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Thanks, guys. All right. Amazon is testing a new way to pay authors by the page. Starting on July 1st, self-published authors on Amazon's lending services service will be paid by how much they, their books are actually read. Peter Weiner is an independent writer who covered the news for The Atlantic. Welcome to you, Peter. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Now, first of all, is this a test? And second, is this for rentals, not purchases? Um, you know, is it a test? It's not introduced as a beta test. It was just came out. They just announced it in a letter to all the authors, a f you know, a few weeks ago. But, you know, it's only for a narrow section of the market. It's just for people who are using, you know, one of their several different lending libraries or their their rental systems, if, you, if that's what you, the word you want to use. And and so you could think of it as a test for the larger market and or you could think of it as something that's just focused on this one particular corner. So I, I am, think this is so interesting. I'm almost, I'm almost rendered speechless. <laughs> Do you think that this will change how much writers write or more specifically the way that they write? Because I know that you wrote a little bit about how this could affect the structure of the stories writers are taking on. Yeah, I, I thought that was the most interesting part about the story. Uh, Amazon has, has has always been great at experimenting, and that that's actually kind of one of the trickier things of explaining this to everyone, because 
they have all these different programs and they have all these different ways of getting a book from the writer to the to the to the Kindle. Um, but you know, when you when you start to think about it, what, what's really new about this is it changes the way that we buy books. And 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 I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I've written you know a dozen or more books over the years, and you know I spend a lot of time thinking about what the market really wants. And you know this this changes the game dramatically um, because. Like I remember when, when I first started doing this, one of my friends who was, who was quite successful as an author said, he goes, well, you know, you don't really want people to read your book. You want people to buy your book. That's the game. And, you know, he, he was right. But this completely changes it around where you don't want to waste your time putting out, you know, you know, padding the book or adding all these sections that make it look more impressive on a, on a, a in a bookstore. You want something that's going to, you know, make the reader, you know, plow through the book. And that's a big change. It, it definitely is. It reminds me of the uh, the story behind the Thousand One Nights, which is supposedly a collection of stories told uh, by a, a Persian wife to her king husband because he was going to execute her the next morning. And so every single night she ended with a cliffhanger and said, I'll tell you the rest tomorrow. And so he kept delaying the execution. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're an author and you're trying to get paid, it feels like you're about to get executed if you're not going to get paid. So, you know, we're going to see some changes in the way things are written now. How do you, I mean, you've written, what, 14 books or something like that. How do you personally feel about this type of monetization, Peter? Well, you know, it, I, I think certainly it's the kind of thing that you expect from technology where, you know, you you remove these kind of inefficiencies. And, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of all the different things that technology can do for us and, and make the world more efficient and, and do a better job of connecting the producers with the consumers and, and making everybody happy. But, you know, I, I, I kind of inhabit a, like a, a, a different type of corner of the publishing world. And, you know, some of the things that we've done over the years, you know, the publishers and me or just me, you know, um, don't really fit in the model that well. Um, and so for instance, like lately I've been experimenting with these really short books and the whole idea was to make something a 10th the size and sell it at a 10th the price and, and see if that was interesting to people. But, you know, when you're doing that, you know, the artistically, what's great about that is that you're producing something that's really nice and short and concise and, you know, people don't have a lot of time. And so maybe that's, that would be good for people. But in this model, you know, if you write one tenth the pages, you're going to get one tenth the money, and you know, hopefully, you know, people are still going to read them at the same rate. That'd be good, but you know, it, it's not necessarily something that you know values, you know, concise, clear, you know, focused writing. What about the opposite, Peter? You know, I'm okay. I'm reading Wolf Hall right now, and it is a slog, and I want to finish it. Uh, but it might take me, <laughs> it might take me years, honestly, to get my head back in and out of it. Do you think this could negatively affect the type of literature that is extraordinarily challenging, but worth it in the end? You know, like your vegetables. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't read that. I've never read that book. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's an issue. I mean, I think in general, you know, if, if they're, if there's a book that people buy because they really aspire to read it and they know it's going to be good and they're going to read, you know, maybe, you know, three chapters every year at the beach, you know, when they, when they have the time to focus and the time to really de devote themselves to it, you know, it's going to be a lot harder on those kind of authors because, you know, they're, they just don't have the, you know, the, the readership's going to take a while for the whatever revenues to stream in. Um, but you know, if it's a, if it's a challenge, it's not necessarily bad if it's a challenging book because if people love it, I mean, I remember I was, there was one book I was reading and it took me, you know, 200 pages to get into it. But then at the end, you know, everything came together and I just couldn't stop reading the last 200 pages. And, and so if, if you're still a good writer and you're able to get that effect, you know, I think you'll do okay. Um, it's the, the real, the people who are really gonna, um, you know, get hurt, I suppose, are the ones who, you know, have like these endless uh, disquisitions on on things that the reader doesn't necessarily want to um, read, and you know, is people are in there for some other reason, I guess. Well, it sure is an interesting experiment. We'll see how they do with it. Peter Wayner is at Wayner.org. That's W-A-Y-N-E-R.org, and you can follow him on Twitter at Peter Wayner. Peter Wayner. Thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. Hey, thanks. Samsung found a new place to sell big screens on the backs of 18-wheeler trucks. The company has hatched a scheme called Safety Truck, 
which puts a camera on the front of a truck and then streams a live video from that camera to a giant TV on the back. The effect is to give drivers behind the truck a view of traffic ahead. And in other words, it's kind of like a, an invisible truck. Uh, Lindsay Turntine, I love this whole concept. I've seen this uh, in research coming out of Japan for a long time. Probably 10 years ago, there was a Japanese university that was selling an invisible invisible clothing. <laughs> Basically, they, <laughs> they had this scheme where, the, where the, they had a jacket that was essentially a projector and a camera mounted on the back of the jacket. So when you look directly at it, you saw what was behind the jacket. Didn't quite work right, but the effect was was an interesting illusion. Uh, in this case, as we're looking, if you're looking at the video version of the show, they've got four essentially big screen TVs on the back of the truck. Um, I think it's a great idea. Certainly, a great business for Samsung. They sell four TVs a truck, <laughs> plus prob <laughs> probably a camera too. What do you think of this idea? Will this ever ever fly? I have lots of thoughts. Um, well, for one thing, I'm really curious about how weatherproof those TVs could be. That yeah, seems yeah. dicey. Uh, in snow or with salt on roads or anything like that. But I, the other thing about it, on one hand, it does seem like it could really improve safety, letting you see whether it's safe to pass, which is the example that Samsung shows over and over again in this video. But when I have, a, when there's a screen in a room or around me, I feel so transfixed by the screen that uh. I don't look at other things going on. And I actually kind of worry about that. We're so trained to watch the screen, I almost wonder if it would be dangerous and distracting in a strange way. Yeah, that's a know. really interesting uh, uh, point because, you know, anything that's streamed as video is, is like you say, that's somehow just weirdly attractive. Even if it's just a video of the road ahead, uh, you know, I <laughs> I have to admit, uh, in my Prius, I have a, a backup screen, you know, it's a little uh, camera video thing and the, the, so the, the controls on the dash become a video screen when I'm backing up. And I, I just... I, you know, I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, I'm just looking at it. It's really, just as you said, it's kind of, you kind of get glued to it, and that can be a danger. So, uh, anyway, it's a, it's an interesting idea. What I'd love to see, though, is, uh, and, and I'm sure we will see, is the use of this type of technology for camouflage, for tanks and military vehicles. Because if you can take whatever's behind a vehicle and put that on the side, side that you that's visible to whomever, then it's essentially camouflage. It essentially becomes it's invisible. So I think that's probably a better, and, and plus you'll transfix the enemy because they'll be watching video. Well, in product <laughs> update news, RDO announced today that it's coming to both Amazon's Fire TV and Amazon TV Stick. The free app will provide Amazon TV customers with streaming radio stations, which can be based on artists, albums, songs, and genres, kind of like Pandora. Uh, as on other platforms, the premium RDO service costs $10 a month. And the... Uh, the, the, the music wars continue, uh, Lindsay Turrentine. Of course, yep. Amazon wants, wants to be a player. What drives me nuts is that we have no idea how big Amazon TV, Fire TV is. No idea whatsoever. They, they're really tight-lipped about those kinds of numbers. Well, in my experience, I, I, I would love to hear from people who think otherwise, but I think it's unusual to use your television platform for streaming music. Most people have another solution. But keep on trucking, RDO. Because it's a tough road ahead. Yeah, it absolutely is. Well, in government crackdown news, the Wall Street Journal reported in an exclusive that the European Commission is getting ready to force major changes on how Google displays search results. These changes include edicts on how Google's search algorithm works to a certain extent, requiring the company to use the, quote, same underlying processes and methods, unquote, for its own services as it does with competing sites. Lindsay Turntine, this gives me the willies, when government <laughs> agencies start dictating algorithmic changes to search results. It seems almost unenforceable. I mean, yeah. Google doesn't share its algorithms, so unless there's a court order to do so, I don't know how anybody would be even be, I don't know, smart and informed enough to interpret whether or not Google is doing what the EU would require it to do. Although, um, it doesn't seem like a crazy idea that if Google's being fair, it should be treating itself the same way it treats other you know, results in its searches. That concept itself doesn't give me the willies. It's yeah. the it's the uh, enforcement of it that seems fraught. I think we had a great conversation on this a couple of times in the past when we talked about stories like this. And I think, you know, personally, I'm convinced that, you know, the idea of objective search results is, um, it's, it's not tr possible uh, to have objective search results. Uh, as I think uh, uh, some other commentators have said, uh, what you're getting when you choose a search engine is that search engine's opinion about what are the best search results. And so to, to make it objective, you have to base it on criteria. 
What criteria? We're going to go back to the days when the number of hits is what determines search engine results. That was a disaster. It's so much better now. And so, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about this. I'm also concerned about Europe, Europe's complete fearlessness in the face of every kind of slippery slope. You, you mentioned how do they enforce it. Well, here's how they enforce it. First thing they do is they pass a rule saying that they all have to be fair. And then the next thing says, well, how we know it's fair? Now we have to pass a law that says you have to show us your search engine exactly. results. And then they get exactly. hacked. And then, you know, it's like yeah. it, it's a slippery slope, just like in the right to be forgotten slippery slope. Oh, you have to you have to censor European search results. Oh, but now people can go to other, you know, the version of Google outside, uh, you know, Europe's. OK, so now you have to search. Uh, censor search results globally for people who live within Europe. So it's, again, they just have a, a, a conspicuous lack of concern about some of these slippery slopes. But uh, we'll see what happens with this one. This is just a, uh, based on uh, inside information from their sources. So they haven't announced anything officially. Well, I got a couple of big numbers for you. The first one is 1,000. That's how many pepper robots SoftBank, cl cl SoftBank claims to have sold in a single minute after the product went on sale Saturday in Japan. 1,000 is also the number SoftBank says they plan to produce each month. This robot, which is designed to read and express emotions, costs about $1,600. Lindsay Turntine, I, I got to say, 1,000 of anything sounds like a tiny number, actually. Well, in la until you think about the this being a $1,600 robot and all it does is be your friend. Right. I mean, yeah. you could buy a Furby for much less. Not that this is a Furby. This is obviously much more sophisticated technology. and It's a really interesting proof, proof of concept. But it is amazing to me that a thousand people were like, I'll spend 1600 bucks to buy a robot friend. Yeah. And they love this kind of thing in Japan. <laughs> Look at this. This is hilarious. They love this kind of thing in Japan. In fact, uh, I read an article, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, I don't recall, but it was uh, a story about how Ibo, remember the uh, Sony Ibo was a little yes, robot yes. dog? Well, People in Japan have, have been keeping them as pets all this time and are completely in love with them. And then at some point they die and they can't get it repaired or the, whatever. Aww. And they actually have funerals for these <laughs> robot dogs. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. But they, they love this kind of thing in Japan. And I think that, you know, my guess is that Japan is just ahead of the curve on falling in love with robots. I think we all will eventually. Uh, well, somebody, somebody I remember who's very smart about this, and I'm trying, I don't remember who it was, said that this is really cultural in Japan, partially for religious reasons, that, that, that the idea of giving human characteristics to inanimate objects is something that's long been accepted in Japan well before robots. Um, so that there's a long history of that, and it just feels more natural in Japanese culture. Yeah, I think it goes back to Shintoism, which is the the primary religion in Japan before Buddhism struck uh, centuries ago. Well, um, another big number for you, 1,500. This is truly a big number. That's how many Android Wear watch faces Google says are now available on the Google Play Store. The company added 17 shiny new ones today in partnership with various fashion designers and popular brands. Most of them are free. Uh, this is uh, one big differentiator between the Apple Watch and the Android Wear watch, which is there are lots and lots and lots of watch faces. I would love, I, I use the Apple Watch and, you know, the, 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 the Apple Watch faces that they have all come from Apple. They're, they're solid watch faces. There's no doubt about it. They are well made. They're, they're well designed. But I got bored with them in about 12 hours, and I'm ready for <laughs> to try some new watch faces, a little bit of individuality instead of having the exact same watch faces, uh, thousands of other people. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know how you feel about some of these watch faces. It's a little bit like, uh, to a certain extent, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, typefaces. When they first came out with laser jet printers, people were using these ridiculous typefaces. But, you know, <laughs> it's a free it's a free world. You know, people can, can be as tacky or as elegant as they want with these watch faces. It's fun to play with. People love choice. They love to fiddle with things. I think this is a great move. It's a great alternative to the Apple Watch ecosystem. You know, and <laughs> I remember being a kid and what, you know, long time ago, but I spent a lot of my money on Swatch watches, partially because you could change everything out, constantly change, switching the bands in and out, changing the little rubber protectors. This is the modern version of that. Yes, it is. Cool. And of course, uh, Apple is going to let people uh, create those little complications, little the, the little things that exist in the watches that show the date or whatever they're going to allow uh, app developers to add a little chunk of information into those. So that's going to be cool as well. So there will be uh, customization in the future for us long-suffering Apple Watch uh, users. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Trenton Moody, who posted this picture on Twitter. 
He casts Tech News Today onto his TV from his podcast app. Sounds like a good idea. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Lindsay Turrentine, what the heck is going on over at CNET? Okay, so here's the deal, guys. We are currently, the CNET main Twitter account is at 999,000 followers. Wow. So if you're not following CNET, do it today. And if you get that, so if it. you get that, if you're the next follower, you get a free Pepper robot, right? <laughs> yeah, we bought all of them and we're going to give them. No, that's not true. Okay. We did not do that. Right. No, you're going to get our undying love and a really special tweet. All right. Well, I better do that right away then. All right, Lindsay <laughs> Turrentine, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Feedly. Or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. Or you can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv. Press the live button. If you're ever near Petaluma, California, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv. And if you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social network of your choice. Tag three friends and recommend that they subscribe. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV, and you can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. Also, don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific, tonight and every weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. This show is technical, directed, and edited by the award-winning Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.